The Zeitgeist Movement defined Essay 13, Post-Scarcity, Trends, Capacity, and Efficiency, Part 4. Efficiency Amplifiers. We will call these Efficiency Amplifiers, and the following list presents examples of needed structural, economic, and social changes which assist this optimized efficiency. Number 1. The pressure for employment for income, or, quote, earning a living, is removed. In the market model, everyone is structurally coerced to engage some form of trade for survival, whether it is trading labor for a wage or creating a product to distribute for profit. This overall pressure, while often touted as an incentive mechanism for social progress, actually reduces overall efficiency greatly, as it does creativity and innovation as well. This creates a spectrum of resource and time waste, since the interest in income generation and the pressure to produce is often absent existing demand. The intent and need to do something to gain income for survival persists regardless of our modern reality that society may not need everyone to participate in the economic process. In an NLRBE, the idea of everyone being required to produce or sell something is viewed as counterproductive, given the trends of ephemeralization and the necessity of now orienting society towards sustainability. Number 2. Production targeting social classes is removed. Social stratification, which is a natural consequence of market capitalism, creates the need to produce a spectrum of qualities for a given good genre. This spectrum is not based on utility or having variation of a good as per the personal needs slash interests of individuals. Rather, each quality standard is intended to be purchased by or made affordable to a given income class. This creates poor quality goods to meet affordability requirements of lower income consumers and hence generates unnecessary waste. In this new strategically sustainable model, no good is created to be cheap by relative standards simply because it fits lower class demographic buying patterns. In an NLRBE, there is no lower class demographic. Number 3. Inefficiency inherent to the competitive practice is removed. Competition between businesses produces four basic forms of unnecessary inefficiency and hence resulting waste. A. Proprietary incompatibility of related goods components, lack of standardization. B. Wasteful multiplicity of goods by competing businesses of the same genre. C. Incentivized good weakness to encourage turnover, planned obsolescence and D, inherent good weakness due to seeking cost efficiency, intrinsic obsolescence. With respect to A, in a sustainable economy there would exist a universal standardization of all related genre components wherever possible. In 1801, a man named Eli Whitney was perhaps the first to apply standardization in an impacting way. He produced muskets, and during his time, there was no way to interchange the parts of different muskets, even though they were the same overall design. If a musket part broke, the whole gun was useless. Whitney developed tools to do this, and after 1801, all parts were fully interchangeable. While most would assume this common sense idea to be prolific across the global industrial community today, the perpetuation of proprietary components by companies that want the consumer to repurchase any such needed component from them directly, ignoring the possibility of compatibility with other producers, creates not only great waste but also great inconvenience. Similarly, with respect to B, a wasteful multiplicity of genre goods by competing businesses is generated at all times in the current model. While less obvious to many, the general competitive nature of the market keeps new ideas invisible from competitors during development. Then a good is produced for purchase that likely has some overall improvement of a given feature. Once that feature is on the market, it is then acknowledged and assessed by competing businesses, and the race to continue improvement moves forward back and forth. While many argue this creative warfare is a driving force of development slash innovation of a given product or purpose, the negative and unnecessary consequence is the rapid, wasteful physical obsolescence inherent to each cycle of output. 
In other words, if a notable cell phone feature improvement is obtained by one company on the heels of a major release by another company that has already started mass production of their phone version without this upgrade, an immediate state of obsolescence is produced resulting in less optimized products which could have been avoided if the producers had been working together as an industrial whole rather than hiding progress and competing. While it may be argued also that it is only through price and the patterns of consumer interest that the knowing of what is in demand or not can be obtained, the truth of the matter is that communication could be made more readily between the design mechanism and the consuming public as well. This bypasses the price demand acceptance slash rejection technique that is also wasteful as well since it requires production to occur in many cases before the actual demand is fully understood. As a final point, a globally interlinked shared data non-competitive oriented design slash production system would also further facilitate the ability to foreshadow component feature improvement over time. This means industry would be able to understand what changes are coming based on progressive trends and design more efficiently in anticipation of those looming changes. Regarding C, or what has been termed planned obsolescence, the interest to see products fail or be less optimized to motivate repeat purchases of the same basic good would no longer be incentivized. The practice of deliberately designed obsolescence has been a hidden part of the industrial approach since the mid-20th century when interest in creating economic growth was high. In an NLRBE, this interest is removed as there is no market incentive to pursue repeat purchases and therefore more optimized efficiency, durability, and sustainability strategies can be applied. Regarding D, or intrinsic obsolescence, as it is termed here, all competition for market share seeks to reduce input costs to whatever degree possible in order to remain affordable in the marketplace and hence persuade the consuming public to purchase one version or brand of one good over another. This has been gestured in American marketing culture as producing the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices. This inherent inefficiency of seeking to reduce costs creates as a systemic result less efficient goods immediately upon production, in the technical sense. Cutting corners in design and production for the sake of preserving money might be considered economically efficient in a market context, but it is clearly economically inefficient in the real world, physical context, as it creates unnecessary waste over time. This is not to say that there are no limits to production optimization given the fact that true design can only be taken on the whole with respect to the state of resources at any given time and associated limitations. This is to say that the use of mere profit-oriented cost efficiency to limit product quality is a wholly unscientific means for such decision making. Number four, property relationships that create use isolation are removed in favor of shared access. As expressed in the prior example regarding automobiles and their use time, in an NLRBE, the property system is replaced by an access system, which creates a more fluid means of shared use goods, which are not needed at all times by a single person. Common examples would be vacation domicile use, transport, seasonal equipment, tools, production equipment, and the like. As an aside, apart from a general overall reduction of production per use time per person, this can assist larger forms of efficiency as far as convenience as well. We can imagine airport or train travel, for example, being redesigned to assist access to various goods locally, so much so that the idea of packing a suitcase was no longer needed. This seemingly minor change alone would positively impact queuing as well as storage in transit, luggage processing, machinery, etc. The chain of alleviation is actually quite extensive when given detailed thought. Clothes, communication tools, recreational items, and the like could all be made available at the destination airport or similar facility upon arrival. While this is foreign to many as an idea, especially given the personalized, oriented nature of our culture, the strife reduced in no longer having to carry large bags and the like could persuade those modern values, given the increased ease. Either way, it comes down to personal choice. In abstraction, a person could literally live without needing to move property around at all. 
moving around the world at will without property-oriented inconvenience. Again, facilitating a means of access where things can be shared will allow many more to gain use of goods they otherwise would not in the current model, along with less being produced in proportion. And NLRBE seeks to create access abundance, not a property abundance. It is also important to note that property is not an empirical concept. Only access is. Property is a protectionist contrivance. Access is the reality of the human slash social condition. In order for one to truly own, say, a computer, one would have had to personally come up with technological ideas that made it work, along with the ideas that comprise the tools of its production. This is literally impossible. There is no such thing as empirical property in reality. There is only access and sharing, no matter what social system is employed. Number five. Design-based recycling is mandated and incentivized, maximizing resource reuse. Contrary to our intuition, there is no such thing as waste in the natural world. Humanity has given very little consideration to the role of material regeneration and how all of our design practices must account for this. As an aside, the highest state of this recycling will eventually come in the form of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology will eventually facilitate the ability to create Create goods from the atomic level up and disassemble goods back into raw atoms. Of course, while this approach appears to be on pace for the future, it is not suggested that such nanotechnology is even needed at this time for us to be successfully regenerative or abundant. Today, industrial recycling is more of an afterthought than a focus. Companies continue to do things such as blindly coat materials with certain chemicals that actually distort the properties of that material, making the material less salvageable by current recycling methods. Overall, strategic recycling is a core seed of maintaining abundance. Every landfill on Earth is just a waste of potential. The law of conservation of mass states that for any system closed to all transfers of matter and energy, the mass of the system must remain constant over time, as system mass cannot change quantity if it is not added or removed. The quantity of mass is conserved over time. This natural law implies that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. Human society's use of resources is perhaps best thought of as a process of intelligent rearrangement rather than of using and discarding. Number six, material use per a given production output is strategically calculated to assure using the most conducive and abundant materials known, as will be expressed more so in the essay, The Industrial Government. A new model of evaluation is created which orients materials based on certain efficiency parameters. Two critical ones are material conduciveness and a material's overall state of abundance. Conduciveness relates to how a appropriate the proposed use is based on the material's properties. Abundance refers to how much of it is available and hence its state of scarcity. Put together, you weigh the value of conduciveness against the value of how accessible and low impact the material is, as compared to other materials that may be more or less conducive and more or less abundant. In other words, it is a synergistic efficiency comparison that makes sure the materials used are optimized for the purpose. Probably the best example of this is home or domicile construction. The common use of wood, brick, screws, and the vast array of parts typical of a common house is comparatively inefficient to more modern, simplified, abundant prefabrication or molded able materials. A traditional 2,000 square foot home is reported to require about 40 to 50 trees. Compare that with houses that can now be created in prefabrication process like mold extrusion with simple earth-friendly polymers, concrete, and other easily formable and movable methods. Such new approaches have a very small footprint as compared to our destruction of global forests for wood. Home construction today is one of the most resource-intensive and wasteful industrial mediums in the world today, and it doesn't need to be that way. Number seven, design conduciveness for labor automation. The more we conform to the current state of rapid, efficient production processes, the more abundance we can create. Most manufacturing approaches typically divide labor into three categories, human assembly, 
mechanization, and automation. Human assembly means handmade. Mechanization means using machines to assist the human worker. Automation means no human interaction in the process. Imagine if you needed a chair and there were three designs. The first is elaborate and complex and could only be done by hand at that time. The second is more streamlined, where its parts could be made mostly by machines, but would need to be assembled by hand in the end. The third is a chair that is produced by one machine process, fully automated. This ladder chair design type would be the design goal in this new approach. What this would do is reduce the variety of automation machine configurations needed. Imagine, if you will, a robotic-based processing plant that can not only produce cars, it can produce virtually any kind of industrial machine good comprised of the same basic set of raw materials. This would increase output substantially. An easy way to understand this trend of simplification is to consider the power of digital software and how one piece of hardware, i.e. computer, can now serve an enormous number of programmable roles. This dematerialization, as it could be termed, is best exemplified by the modern cell phone due to the vast program applications now available for such smartphones from medical measurements to full musical synthesizers. The functionality of these small handheld computers can now take on almost countless roles. Such roles long ago, before the digital age, would have usually required one hardware configuration for each task. Today, any basic operating system can run a dramatically large number of programmed functions all contained in a small device. This logic applies to the nature of physical machine production as well as it is simply a matter of time before the act of producing a vast array of goods can be accomplished by small, modular mechanical systems just like a digital operating system can conduct almost countless programmed functions. Number 8 serviceable problems resulting from the prior inefficient economic process are reduced if not eliminated. This idea is often difficult to fully comprehend, as the chain of causality resulting from one general inefficiency can be vast and complex. For example, the resolution of water scarcity alone has enormous preventative potential for disease. The amount of labor and resources once used for treating those then resolved diseases can find other roles. Energy abundance has the same reality since energy is the driver of all human activity. A clean, reliable, renewable state of absolute energy abundance would have enormous effects on the production and abundance capacity of this future society. Likewise, the pursuit of meeting human needs and the removal of labor for income occupations, which often have no real technical function, would set in motion a new educational possibility, reinforced by an incentive to pursue personal interests and hence the freedom not to feel pressured away from fields of interest, since survival and well being are already taken care of by the social model itself. It is hard to imagine the explosion of creativity possible when this pressure is removed and society is set free to think clearly. Number 9. Invigorating the group mind meaning human connection and the sharing of ideas will bring ever accelerating progress. Similar to the prior point, the internet has become a powerful tool for research and idea expansion. While open source research and development gets a fair amount of attention today, the ability to harness the communicative power of the internet to create a global dialogue about any given technology or idea will facilitate a type of interactive development never before seen once focused. The Game Changers the discussion of advanced technologies which can dramatically transform the unfolding of the future and assist the pursuit of post-scarcity have not been a focus of this essay, as it becomes too easy to simply assume the reality of the speculations. A great number of futurists have done just this with mixed results, and oftentimes it leaves the audience with looming, premature expectations, waiting around for this or that new technology to finally progress. However, to dismiss these potentials is equally as hasty. The truth of the matter is that our capacity to accelerate such change comes down to our focus. Just as the Manhattan Project was able to bring countless scientists together for a single output goal, as violent as it may have been to build the atom bomb, the idea of global network projects to rapidly accelerate new technical possibilities is merely a matter of choice. We can only imagine the progress of any given project if enough minds come together to pursue it at once in an organized way. 
This open source world approach alone will likely have limitless possibilities. Likewise, there is no shortage of transformational or disruptive technologies on the horizon that could radically alter the industrial landscape. Artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, 3D printing, infinite computing, and nanotechnology are just a few. Each of these developing mediums has vast implications for efficiency increases. It is very difficult to know exactly how they will unfold or, more importantly, how they will find synergy, but we do know the trends of development are increasing exponentially in most cases. For example, a fusion of 3D printing, nanotechnology, AI, and robotics will forever alter the state of manufacturing so much so that a person could perhaps have a garage-sized manufacturing system in their home to produce virtually anything they may need. Again, while such futuristic and seemingly science fiction speculations are unneeded to justify our modern tangible capacity to create abundance, these new and emerging mediums should not be overlooked as they are set to have a great impact if embraced properly. In the 19th century, aluminum was more valuable than gold, even though it is technically one of the most abundant elements in the world. However, before the discovery of electrolysis, it was extremely difficult to extract. Once this technical process was discovered, almost overnight the scarcity of the material plummeted. Today we tend to use aluminum with a throwaway mindset. Such dramatic historical changes are important to keep in mind as the same kind of advancement is occurring across many disciplines, often hidden from most people's comprehension and far beyond their expectations. Likewise, the aforementioned technologies are on pace to dramatically change the world. Raw Resource Assessment as noted, assessing the state of natural resources to gauge the degree of total maximum use capacity as per the human population cannot be done by simply extrapolating around current methods. We need to get both a general sense of current inventory levels of all relevant earthly resources and then digest them with respect to the aforementioned efficiency amplifiers, which in effect radically change the way industrial practice and consumption unfolds. It is also worth noting that modern science has brought a great deal of synthesis into play and the use of polymers, metamaterials, and other rapid advancements in chemistry, physics, and engineering are accelerating. The end result is that many resources considered problematic, such as rare earth metals, are finding replacements via highly abundant means. It is important to point out that most perspectives on current resource use trends are quite negative by those thinking within the context of the current model. There is no shortage of negative reports, and rightly so. We have been abusing and misusing our resources to a vast degree, locked into a life-blind paradigm which has little structural comprehension of its consequences. However, again, this is actually a mismanagement problem, not a quantitative or empirical one. It is also important to note that it is not how much or how little there is of any one thing in absolute terms. Rather, the qualifier has to do with how we are to achieve the purpose sought. For instance, the available amount of oil in the earth as would be needed for its non-energy uses today, since in this model it isn't needed for energy as noted, is only as relevant as our incapacity slash capacity to find other ways to achieve the same goals oil has achieved, but without it. Another example is lumber. If home construction completely transcended the use of wood frame houses globally, using earth-friendly concrete and polymer processes instead coming from ubiquitous and abundant raw materials, suddenly a once potentially scarce resource becomes exceptionally abundant, relatively speaking. Moving on, natural resources are best organized initially by dividing them into A, biotic, and B, abiotic. Biotic resources are derived from the biosphere and are often called living resources. Examples of biotic resources are forests, plants, animals, etc. By some definitions, it also includes resources originating from life in the distant past, such as fossil fuels. Abiotic resources are often considered non-living resources and include water, soil, minerals, and the like. A. Overall, the biotic resources of the planet have been suffering greatly due to ever-increasing industrialization, forest depletion, the loss of biodiversity, loss of fish populations, and other issues have brought the sustainability of many such resources into question. 
In all cases, the problem is not a limited supply of these resources. It is a blatant disregard for any equilibrium with natural regeneration and basic environmental respect. The solution to these declines is to obviously deviate from their rate of use. This can be done by simply substituting other comparable materials for those being harvested at unsustainable rates. In the essays, True Economic Factors and the Industrial Government, this process is described in detail. In short, there is no biotic resource being used today which cannot have its rate of consumption subsided by conscious strategic adjustment. Wood does not need to be used today for all the current purposes. Not everyone needs to eat fish from the wild ocean as advanced and humane aqua farming processes now exist. We have already discussed the ability to produce a vegetarian abundance with vertical farming and the move to in vitro meat can be more healthy and sustainable than livestock methods that are damaging the environment. With such alleviations, we would see a vast improvement in overall resources, biodiversity, the preservation of life-saving medicine derived from the rainforests, and so forth. The other largely untapped renewables mentioned prior can also rapidly displace fossil fuels for energy use today. So the issue is really a matter of intelligent choice. B. Abiotic resources have a different yet similar management reality. We have already addressed our technical ability to circumvent or solve the problem of water scarcity with purification methods and our rapidly depleting topsoil with soilless farming. Overall, the main resources we are left with are the valuable minerals we utilized to build many of the goods we use. These minerals are mostly compounds of earthly elements and are extracted from rocks from the Earth's crust. Much progress in use versatility has also been achieved by industry by extracting elements and forming metal alloys. An alloy is a metal mixture made by combining two or more metallic elements, such as the formation of steel. There are close to five thousand known minerals and the number of alloys possible is enormous, with many thousands in use today. As far as analysis, the British Geological Survey BGS, outputs a statistical assessment of world minerals slash elements slash chemical compounds each year regarding global extraction production use. 73 are documented in their 2007-2011 report and hence these can be considered the most utilized for global industrial production. Of those, the BGS in turn updates a risk list of such materials based on stressed or anticipated stressed supply. The following chart on page 220 of this book expresses the medium risk to very high risk elements as per their analysis. The BGS states the list provides a quick and simple indication of the relative risk in 2012 to the supply of elements or element groups that we need to maintain our economy and lifestyle. The position of an element on this list is determined by a number of factors that might affect availability. These include the natural abundance of elements in the Earth's crust, the location of current production and reserves, and the political stability of those locations, recycling rates, and substitutability of the elements has been considered in the analysis. The qualifier of political stability slash governance is actually not relevant empirically. This is a cultural problem. It should be stated up front that an NLRBE is achieved by global cooperation and the common war patterns, the resource curse and disruptions in the supply chain by such contrived self-preserving pressures common of world powers would no longer be a problem. Overall, the BGS rightfully concludes that substitutability and recycling are the solutions and the scarcest resources essentially suffer from a lack of recycling and a lack of adequate substitutions being made. Rather than address each material noted, the first one listed, rare earth metals, will be used as the example by which problem resolution can be considered with all the others. There are 17 rare earth metals that are considered the most scarce of all elements. Recycling. The first great failure is that only 1% of all rare earth minerals are recycled today, according to some estimates. Given their common use in electronics, electronic waste recycling has also been dis 
abysmal. Based on EPA statistics, in the U.S. in 2009, only 25% of consumer electronics were collected for recycling. Likewise, the goods created that hold most of these valuable materials are also not even intended to be recycled for the most part. According to an organization called Second Wave Recycling, for every 1 million cell phones recycled, we can recover 75 pounds of gold, 772 pounds of silver, and 33,274 pounds of copper. If the United States recycled the 13 million cell phones that are thrown away annually, we could save enough energy to power more than 24,000 homes for a year. Substitutions. Perhaps more importantly, it is now possible to manufacture synthetic versions of these metals in the context of their properties out of very common abundant materials in a lab. Nanotechnology is proving to be very strong in this approach. Many different industries have been actively working to address the issue in each application, such as now being able to make LED bulbs without these metals. Overall, we see the push to solve this problem ramping up, and the fact is, resolution is simply a matter of ingenuity, focus, and time. Industrial reorientation is also important to add to this problem-solving equation as a larger tier form of substitutability. While this may not currently apply to rare earth metals as much at this time, larger scale components in various technologies are changing rapidly. It is a design initiative in engineering to actively focus on component innovation that can bypass such needs. However, given the rate of change for rare earth metal substitution through synthesis, it appears to be simply a matter of time before this issue is resolved through a combination of strategic use, recycling, and synthesis. Beyond that, it cannot be reiterated enough that the great failure of global industry has been not to make proper purpose comparisons when it chooses to use a certain material. In other words, it is not intelligent to use a very rare metal in a generally arbitrary and fleeting product. Since there is no referential database that shows active rates of use, decline, and the like, companies make their decisions based merely on cost relationships, which have very little value in the sense of strategic use by comparison. While it is true that price can reflect scarcity and difficulty of acquiring a certain mineral or element, such a dire reality arises only as the problem acutely materializes. In other words, no real foresight exists in price and by the time price reflects what was actually an observable technical reality at any time, it is often too late and the scarcity becomes a real problem. In an actively aware resource management system, this would not occur. Not only would such materials be constantly compared to draw assessment as to what is the most appropriate material for a given use, any foreshadowed problem can be seen from a long period away, and hence efficiency can be better maximized. Land. Unlike prior assessments, the issue of land access takes a different consideration. Earth has a finite amount of inhabitable land and hence the method by which humans gain access to and share land over time is the real issue. Needless to say, not every human being can have his or her own private earth. Likewise, the sickness bred by materialism, wealth, and status which manifests vast and enormous estates by the super-rich fall in the same irrational category, utterly oblivious to sustainability and social balance. Today, the property system creates a static orientation to land access, with people typically acquiring land and staying on it indefinitely. This tendency to settle seems compounded by the labor roles and location requirements of most in the world as well. The tradition of commuting to one's job in a city center is still very common and hence one's home needs to be nearby. In an NLRBE, such pressures are greatly alleviated and the idea of traveling the world constantly is a tangible option. Analysts have found that if we needed to fit the world's 7 billion people into a single city modeled after New York City, all earthly inhabitants would fit in the U.S. state of Texas. While clearly impractical, this simple statistic reveals the vast degree of variance possible regarding how human beings can organize themselves topographically in a global society. The problem isn't the amount of physical space needed for 7 billion or many times more. The problem is intelligent organization, design, and education.
That noted, the method of access for an NLRBE is to create an interactive sharing system. The foundation of this idea will be expanded upon greatly in the essay, The Industrial Government. In short, people are able to travel from destination to destination, enjoying a given location for a period before likely moving on. Such systems already exist in the current system where a network of people and domiciles is available for sharing. Of course, many used to a home-oriented frame of mind, which has a traditional romanticism, should not be fearful of losing such emotional security. There is no reason why a permanent location for a person or family cannot exist as we find in the world today. In fact, in a society predicated on access abundance, finding and living in a permanent abode would likely be far easier than in a property ownership society. Yet, statistics prove that today people very much enjoy moving around, exploring, and and enjoying new places. If it weren't for their labor for income job and monetary limitations, it is clear a great deal more traveling would occur by the vast majority. Once such an access system is set in motion, the network of available places to stay and visit would open up and close down in a natural flow, just as hotels work. When a hotel is booked and full for a given day, naturally others seeking to visit that region look elsewhere. As demand ebbs and flows, feedback is used to produce new structures and the like. No different again than how it is done today in the vacation market. The educational and value imperative is the idea of sharing the world. Many today would consider this to be grossly idealized. The idea of freely moving about the planet, staying virtually anywhere with no obligation to feel the need to return to any central place, seems like a fantasy. Yet it is very possible. Also, since remote communication is exponentially increasing, engaging in any social community task or creative interest can occur virtually anywhere as well. Again, this is a value choice. If a person wishes to keep his family in one place for the rest of their lives, there is more than enough space on the planet, given the Texas statistics noted, to provide for both possibilities. Assuming an intelligent revision of city layouts, responsible conservation, and an earnest interest to be efficient, either way, the same access system can be employed to find and settle a certain location, whether whether it is temporary or permanent. Oil. In conclusion to this essay, issues surrounding modern society's addiction to the use of oil are important to address. Oil is likely the most industrial resource utilized on the planet today, used most notably for transport, as described prior between battery technology, improved design, and the vast renewable mediums we have today, there is no legitimate technical reason we need gasoline to power automobiles anymore. The handful of currently available electric cars today is also a clear testament to this fact. Airplanes and other extremely large powered machines might still need such oil force currently, but the trends show it is simply a matter of time and focus before planes are able to use solar energy coupled with advanced storage means for large-scale heavyweight commercial needs. Yet, we should always try to think outside of the box when it comes to efficiency and sustainability. In the context of this large-scale, high-energy transport, the question arises, is there a replacement for plane travel which bypasses such high-concentration energy needs? The answer is yes. Maglev technology is many times faster and uses a fraction of the energy. So, even if some oil was used for power purposes here and there, such new approaches could reduce its use footprint exponentially if pursued correctly. In America alone, 70% of the oil used in total goes towards transport in the form of gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. Likewise, if a new condition of peace can be negotiated on planet Earth with a concentrated pressure to reduce armaments and preparations for war, an extensive oil savings would also occur. The United States Department of Defense is one of the largest single consumers of energy in the world, responsible for 93% of all U.S. government fuel consumption in 2007. The U.S. military uses more energy than most countries. The military is also one of the greatest polluters in the world. So working to shut down all military establishments would facilitate a vast increase in this resource's abundance. 
Yet, as noted, oil is still polluting in multiple ways, so using it as we have for combustion is not environmentally intelligent. The real solution is social revision. While the edifice of human society today has a vast dependence on oil and gas in general, generating all sorts of products from plastics and fertilizers, creative engineers have been slowly challenging this core chemical foundation need for many years. Plastics, which are ubiquitous in the world today, have been almost exclusively in the territory of petroleum for some time. However, recently, Dutch scientists have invented means to replace oil-based plastics by using plant matter. Likewise, an organization called Evocative has been able to use mushrooms to generate fully sustainable materials, which can also serve to replace many petroleum uses for insulation and the like. Overall, a great deal of scientific work is going into substitutes for petroleum, and most are plant oils and fats because they have essentially the same base chemical structure as petroleum. So the real issue again is focus. Today, commercially available non-petroleum-based plastic bottles, bioplastic, are becoming much more common, so it is clear that the real solution to evolving out of our material petroleum dependence is an issue of intention by the scientific community. Agriculture is another concern. Fertilizers and pesticides require oil and natural gas, and it is well argued that modern civilization, given its rate of food consumption and growth, based on current methods, would not be able to function without these base means. This is likely true, however, that is partly why the prior vertical farming section is so important. Rather than seek to replace these mediums within the context of traditional agriculture, the solution is to bypass the the problem with the new methods. Overall, if you think of anything oil and hydrocarbons do today, you can either find an establishment preserving replacement for it, i.e. the plant oil-based plastics which can work in most existing industrial contexts, or a completely new approach based on revised methods which bypass the problem altogether, i.e. vertical farming and its little need for such fertilizer. Not to mention if we remove oil and gas simply from the main combustion purposes, you then free up so much of it that a Apart from environmental concerns, the resource becomes that much more abundant, giving even more time to find further solutions to eliminate any and all environmentally unsustainable realities. Techno-Capitalist Apologetics at the root of the increased capacity for abundance, as noted prior, is ephemeralization, or doing more with less. Moore's Law, which is the phenomenon that computer power or chip performance essentially doubles every 18 months, has been found in the modern day to also include any kind of information-based technology. For example, the application of labor automation, which is a combination of robotics and programming, both of which are defined by information in origin, reveals how the means of production itself is becoming an information technology and hence subject to exploitation exponential growth as well. In financial terms, the result of this pattern has been cheaper price values, as the efficiency inherent reduces costs to whatever degree allowed. This can be seen in the sharp rise in inexpensive and now ubiquitous technologies, such as cell phones. In absolute abstraction, with all things being equal, Assuming society maintained only its current spectrum of use goods, many production trends have the capacity to approach near zero value. Given this, the question arises, at what state of such exchange value reduction, price, does value itself become so minuscule as to become moot in and of itself as an economic factor? Can we expect that potential to occur to such an anticipated high degree in the market system? The answer is no. The market will never create such large-scale, dramatic, post-scarcity implying reductions overall due to its central need for scarcity to keep monetary turnover and hence keep people employed. It is worth noting that many in the modern technology movements still justify the existence of market capitalism as a means towards abundance by observing this general cost reduction phenomenon. As the argument goes, the unfolding of a given production and its increased demand facilitates better production methods and hence more savings by the company means more savings by the consumer. This then makes some goods available over time to those who would not 
not have been able to afford them prior. If taken at face value, this observation suggests all goods will approach zero in value over time as a given market increases in demand. The first problem, however, is that this argument simply ignores the vast array of general technical inefficiency which can also, if addressed and solved, create those same reduced costs. In other words, it conflates erroneously market efficiency and technical efficiency. Globalization is a common example. While cheap, primitive third world labor might be helpful to bring the cost down of a given product for the American consumer market, the wasted energy, wasted resources, and possibly inhumane conditions created slash exploited to facilitate that price advantage really present deep and caustic inefficiencies in the broad view. As an aside, while it is indeed true that certain types of technology, usually computer-related, are today widely available for many who otherwise would not be able to afford it, this is a result of scientific ingenuity, not the market. Many traditional economists today make the assertion constantly that if it weren't for capitalism, etc., the truth is that the market is nothing more than an incentive and delivery system, and while the profit motivation may at times incorporate high levels of technical advancement, which achieve a higher output potential, invigorating this more with less phenomenon, this is but one possible outcome amongst many. Many other highly profitable means can be utilized which have zero to negative value in the pursuit of post-scarcity itself. Perhaps the best way to think about it is as a self-limiting threshold. The profit goal of cost efficiency is to remain competitive against other producers, while naturally seeking maximum income to keep employees paid and the structure of the company intact. That is the incentive equation. Obviously, no company wants to make itself obsolete by pursuing a state of extreme efficiency. Likewise, profit culture is short-sighted by nature. This means that when faced with a decision for cost efficiency, the easiest and most immediate path to realize this change will likely be pursued. That can again mean the difference between updating a technical operation to be more efficient in its process of actual production, or simply outsourcing to a developing country which can be paid so little due to existing poverty, if it looks best on paper as far as cost savings. The market sees no difference between the two. Decisions are based merely on the trade value and the end tends to justify the means. So, as time progresses, the market process may indeed continue to make certain high demand goods more accessible to those who couldn't afford them prior. However, that is not evidence that the fruits of a true post-scarcity oriented society can be obtained on the whole in the same framework. It will only be through a direct revision of society to accept the post-scarcity intent, removing the interest to preserve scarcity, which is common today, that true progress in abundance will be realized. This conclusion is also avoiding the vast array of other large-scale efficiency problems inherent to market capitalism with respect to cultural and environmental sustainability, which have been discussed at length in other essays. As a final note, the debate over technological unemployment has proven to be a powerful revelation in this clash of perceived intentions as well. Capitalist apologists have been hiding behind the idea that while technology does replace human labor, it is also creating it. While this may have been true in the slower moving past, a highly skewed reality has become ever more apparent. For one, the exponential increases occurring today have proven to be outpacing human educational adaptation greatly. There is no one-to-one -one job loss to job creation process unfolding in the modern world. Job losses today and job loss possibilities for the future are enormous when the machine applications are reviewed objectively, given the exponential trends. The interesting thing is that this very process of automation is a huge part of creating abundance, even though companies, in the logic of seeking profit, are using it to save money. The result is a complex dichotomy with fewer human workers and hence less money available as purchasing power. Of all the symptoms of failure of the capitalist model, this technological unemployment phenomenon just might be the most profound as it really reveals a clash of system functions. Capitalism presupposes that human labor demand will be near constant and all-encompassing. Yet if it is cheaper to employ machines to do human roles, how do we get spending money to humans who have now been removed from the labor force due to those very machines? How can the machine continue to produce
produce without the fuel of monetary circulation. In the end, the reduced value argument within the capitalist context simply doesn't work, as it assumes a direct balance adjustment between cost and reduced price value, saving of money due to mechanization to lower final good price to meet the ever-decreasing purchasing power of the now poorly employed consumers, those jobs removed due to mechanization. The only way this could work is if the profit motive itself was removed, which is essentially impossible if we are still to think within the context of a market economy. The only reason companies employ technology to replace human labor to begin with is to save money and increase their competitive place in the overall economy by some degree. This intention undermines any kind of distribution balance between buying power and cost savings.